Hello and welcome back to Bicycle Eggs and another episode of Studio Albums Ranked. And once again, I have the wonderful Peter Kerr with me from Rock Daydream Nation. Hello. Good evening, sir. How are you going? Going well. And today we are going to be closing out our Midnight Oil trilogy by doing a Studio Albums Ranked show. And um, there are 13 albums in total, studio albums by Midnight Oil. We're not going to go into detail about these albums as we go along because we've already done two shows where we've talked about all the albums in great detail. This is just going to be our ranking, so we're going to blow through this fairly quickly. And um, let's get straight into it. And, Peter, give us your number 13. Well, my number 13, if you watched uh, last week's show, wouldn't come as a surprise, is Redneck Wonderland. I'm not a big fan of this album. Look, Midnight All never did a total one-star dud, but this is so far below par comparative to their other albums. I love the sentiments. It was angry. It was politically protesting um, the forces in the day that uh, were quite adverse to Australia. But um, sonically, I think it's quite dated because it um, sort of embraces um, techno, um, synthesizers electro pop i just don't like the sound the sonics of it and it's kind of i think it's like their version of u2 pop album it, they're so embracing the technology they're forgetting what actually made midnight oil tick so mm -hmm. for me it's it's abrasive there's not much melody in it number 13 for me is redneck yep. wonderland no fair enough my number 13 is going to be capricornia from 2002 the main reason i agree with peter in that there are no duds in this catalog there's nothing for me there's nothing any lower than very good this is still a very good album as i said in the last show that we did last week the thing for me with this album that makes it stick out from all the other midnight oil albums is it doesn't sort of have a unified sound it has some of these songs sound like early Midnight Oil. Some of them sound sort of diesel and dusty. Some of them sound a little later in the catalogue, sort of early to mid 90s. Uh, and there's nothing overly wrong with that. It's just I'm used to my Midnight Oil album sounding, having a, a distinct sound throughout the whole album. And this one doesn't really have it, but it still has some wonderful songs on it. You know, Golden Age, Capricornia, Poets and Slaves, Say Your Prayers. There's really good Midnight Oil material on this album. It's just because it's lacking that unified sound that I rank this one at the bottom, but it's still an album that's well worth checking out. Okay. So your number 12? Um, my number 12 is Capricornia yeah. um, for the same reasons as you. I think it's a very stripped-back album. Um, I think the themes, they're kind of really looking more they're more introverted in their themes talking instead of being universal world themes they're talking about australia it's one of um the most um one of their albums where they're most in touch with the land a lot of the the themes of this album are kind of um, ecological etc cetera, etc cetera. i think um sonically it's all over the shop I agree with you. Like there's some songs that you, th you hear the jangly pop of um, like the birds and then it'll go into something that's more traditional for on the floor of Midnight Oil. It's very diverse. But um, look, um, yeah, it's not a dud album. It's got a lot of merit, but you've got to rank it somewhere, Bicycle Legs, and um, mm. that's my number 12. Yeah. For similar reasons as yours. Yeah. Well, my number 12 probably won't come as a huge surprise to you based on last week's show. It's going to be their most recent album, which is Resist. And I like this album. There's a lot of really good songs on it. But as I said in last week's show, to me, it's just a little too long. It's about an hour long. Um, I would love it cut back to a sort of 40, 45-minute single album. Um, it's still got some wonderful songs. They still definitely have it. Um it sounds like Midnight Oil, which is really, really good. You know, you pointed out some of the great songs on this album when we did last week's show, like Rising Seas and Nobody's Child and We Are Not Afraid. There's lots of really good Midnight Oil on here. It's just a little over long for me, and that's why I'm ranking it at number 12. As you say, got to rank it somewhere. So Yeah, absolutely. All righty. Um, my number 11 is the self-titled debut Midnight Oil 
Now, mm. this is not to say that this is a, um, again, not a bad album, but it's a band that's just finding their feet. It's their first statement. Um, again, this is a, probably their most post most post punk album. Um, it has a lot of the influences that how they formed their sound, whether it's surf music, whether it um, you know influ- it's influenced by the Saints or Radio Birdman, whatever music that they were listening to when they first started out. Um, you know, as I said, it's you can see that the Midnight Oil haven't fully formed, and they're trying to find their sound and and get their groove. Um, even early on, you can see that, um, you know, Garrett is covering a lot of um, topics that he would, you know, explore in later albums. But I just think this is, I, I choose this as my number 11 because, you know, sonically, it's not quite the Midnight Oil that had been fully formed. And, you know, yeah, that's that's the reason why I put it at number um, 11. Yeah, no, that's understandable. My number 11 might be a little controversial, so please bear with me, but my number 11 is Blue Sky Mining from 1990. Now, as you mentioned in last week's show, this album has some really high highs, but there's a bit of filler on this album. Um, You know, but the bits that are great are wonderful. Blue Sky Mine, Forgotten Years, King of the Mountain, One Country, um, you know, Stars of Warburton, really good songs. Um. But as you say, there is a little bit of filler on this album. And also, this to me is Midnight Oil at their most commercial sounding. They really sound like they're chasing that American dream on this album as far as the sound of the album goes. You know, some of the raw, rough edges have been smoothed off on this album. So that's why I'm ranking this one at number 11, because it's a good album, but it's not a perfect album, not by any stretch. Okay. No, oh, nice take. Um, my number 10 is going to be Breathe. So this is another midnight, um, a later Midnight All album where they're quite introverted. They're kind of introspective. Um, I like it. They were exploring a lot of uh, different musical genres. Uh, so their palette was embracing all country. I mean, there was there's a couple of songs that sound like uh, Neil Young, um, Home, which was a, a duet between Peter Garrett and Emmy Lou Harris. That should have been a, a hit, actually. Um, wonderful song, bit of a ballad. But if you're expecting the spiky, angry, punchy, four on the floor rock of Midnight Oil, you won't find too much in this, this particular album. Um, thematically, it's very much about the ecology. Um, it's like Capricornia. It's very much with the land and um, and nature. Um, but f- if you look at the whole discography of Midnight Oil, there's nothing that really is is hooky and as um, poptastic as some of the you know their mid 80s or early 90s successes this is Mm. much more of a quieter album so that's my number 10 yeah no fair enough my number 10 is your number 11 which is the debut midnight oil also known as the blue meanie the thing about this album there's the, the the bits that are on this album the songs that are on this album that just kick ass things like powder works um things like run by night um, used and abused. This album's really badly produced, though. It sounds like it was recorded in a tin can. Um, and there's one or two bits of this album where they kind of, as you said, they hadn't fully found their sound. And I feel like there's a song or two on here that they would never sort of go in that direction again. Things like um, Nothing Lost, Nothing Gained. You know, it's this sort of almost... Uh, I don't know how to explain it, but it's it's the sort of music that they would never really go to again because I think they realised that that wasn't where this band was supposed to be heading. It's sort of this slow and, um, you know, just, yeah, it just doesn't really sound like a Midnight Oil song. But the bits that are great on this album are just absolutely classic. But go and find a live album that has Powder Works or Run By Night or Used and Abused on it because those live albums will be much better than the versions on the debut album. They'll sound a lot better too. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right. My number nine is uh, Red Sails in the Sunset. So, um, again, this is a, an album that's very much of its of its day. It's embracing te technology. But unlike Redneck Wonderland, to me, to my ears, it doesn't sound so dated um, because I think they're using the technology um, more complementary to the, the songs. Uh, this album is kind of famous for three crackers of um, or bangers of tracks. Um, Best of Both Worlds, I think that's top shelf Midnight Oil, so that gets a big tick. Kosciuszko, another rousing anthem, that's a big tick. And I have a, a soft spot for generals as well. Mm. Uh, beyond those three songs, uh, to the common person in the street, if I showed them a song listing, they'd probably have a very non-plus glazed look. Um, whether it's filler or deep tracks, it's sort of, mm, it's probably lost to the Midnight Oil um, B-side. I don't know, a little bit more too deep. You know what I mean? Um, I think people have forgotten a lot of those tracks, um, but it should get more recognition. It's a very clean and um, precise sounding album. So it's very concise. And um, I think they really did blow their budget on this one, didn't they? Bicycle Legs recorded mm. it in Tokyo. And um, yeah, um, but I like it. Red Sails and the Sunset. Um, to me, the songs are there, um, but purely just for the three songs, Generals, Best of Both Worlds, and Kosciuszko. That's why I put it as my number nine. Yeah, no, fair enough. My number nine is The Macarada Project from 2020. This is a great album. I mean, this is the point at in the catalogue for me, you know, from number nine onwards, we're really talking about great albums, in my humble opinion. Um, This was a wonderful comeback. I mean, it was their first album in 18 years. You know, Capricornia came out in 2002. This came out in 2020. Um, so much had happened between then. But as soon as you listen to the song First Nation, Gadigal Land, Midnight Oil are back and back in a huge way. Um, you've got wonderful guests, you know, mostly um, Indigenous artists that are collaborating with on this album. The album is all about Indigenous themes It's just wonderful Midnight Oil record, especially considering how long out of the game they'd been. To come back with something like this, absolutely brilliant. That's my number nine. Nice, nice. Well, I'm going to choose um, no head injuries. Um, well, head injuries. Um, I think this is a, a great cracker of a, an album. Um, Cold Cold Change is just a, a cracker. It's... I actually think this is their hardest hitting record. Is it post punk? Is it metal? Um, I think it's just solid rock. Um, Section five, Naked Flame, back on the borderline. You starting to see Midnight Oil um, being more, you know, start, starting to get find their sound down pat. And um, lyrically, you know, talking about um, all the things that uh, we we know Midnight Oil to be, social injustices, the politics of the day, et cetera, et cetera. So Head Injuries is my number eight pick. And, um, yeah, yeah, I love it. Great. My number eight is going to be Redback Wonderland from 1998. Those of you who will have watched last week's show will know that Peter and I disagreed quite a bit on this album. I like this album a lot. It does have, you know, they do use a lot of technology on this album, but I think they use it in service of the songs. Um, this is the angriest they ever sounded on a record, especially songs like Redneck Wonderland and Concrete and Cemetery in My Mind, White Skin, Black Heart. Those songs are just so angry. and um, But then you get some light, you know, some quieter moments to catch your breath and reflect like the great gibber plane and then drop in the ocean which is you know just a killer album closer but um i really like this album it you know maybe not as much as i did when it first came out but um i really do like this album so that's my number eight yeah good um my number seven is blue sky mine so um This album's dominated by maybe three singles, which were saturated in the day and actually are played 
um, in high rotation, a lot of classic rock, a lot of rock station. You can actually hear some of the songs in pipe elevator music or in, in your supermarket. I'm talking about Blue Sky Mine, King of the Mountain, um, and Forgotten Years. Now, get it out of the way. Forgotten Years is like top five midnight oil. It's a wonderful land from love it. Um, Blue Sky Mine, you know, the the wonderful harmonica of Peter Garrett, and it's got that Motown swing to it. Lyrics are very dark. Um, and, uh, you know, King of the Mountain, um, that's that's a nice song too, which I thought it was about Peter Brock, but it's about something completely different. <laughs> Um, this album's got a, you know, a little bit of filler on it, um, but there's some wonderful other deep tracks that uh, don't get the recognition like Antarctica, One Country, um, you know, Bedlam Bridge, uh, which was another single. And I think you pointed that out, Bicycle Leaks, last week, um, which yeah. is a wonderful metaphor, you know, that covers the haves and the have-nots. This was Midnight Oil at their very um, highest commercial peak, but um, for me, that um, if you balance it off, even though that these songs are well known and flogged to death, they are, you know, at the end of the day, wonderful songs, and that lifts it above yeah. the pack. And um, yeah, that's my number seven. Yeah, my number seven is going to be "Red Sails in the Sunset" from nineteen eighty four. Um, you know, the songs that you mentioned that are the sort of the best known songs, best of both worlds, Kosciuszko, When the Generals Talk. You know, the funny thing is When the Generals Talk and Kosciuszko were both singles and they're not sung by Peter Garrett. They're sung by Rob Hurst, oh. which is they're pretty much the only two songs where he takes the sole lead vocal. Um, but you've also got things like um, Helps Me, Helps You and Sleep. I love Sleep. I think that's one of my favourite songs of theirs. Um, uh, Jimmy Sharman's Boxers, you know, talking about um, Indigenous people being exploited for these boxing shows that they used to have in the 19th century and early 20th century. You know, um, who can stand in the way? Yeah, there's a lot of technology on this album, but, again, I think they use it uh, really well. Yeah. Um, the songs are great. I really think this is possibly Midnight Oil at their most experimental musically, uh, and I like that about this album. So that's my number seven, Red Sails in the Sunset. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I guess would you agree that there are a lot of tracks um, that have just seemed to be forgotten on this album? There's yeah, absolutely. Of, yeah. It, it, they have, and I think, again, this is an album that needs revisiting. Absolutely. All right, my number six is Resist, which is their last album. I thought this was just when I heard the first song, Rising Seas, and you've got that um, that thumping um, guitar line and Rob Hurst on the drums and then Peter Garrett, you know, singing this lyric, which is like a call to arms. I thought, oh, Midnight Oil are back in a big, big way. It's a rousing song. Um Yes, it does go for 60 minutes. Yes, there are 12 songs. But um, to me, there's no fatigue factor because there's enough variety with the songwriting. You've got, um, you know, Jim Morgini does a lot of songs. Um, Rob Hurst, Garrett writes, has penned a lot of the self pen songs himself. Um, you know, it covers all the, you know, wonderful type of sonic um geography that a, a midnight oil album would have whether it's jangly whether it's acoustic whether you know it's just peter garrett with a, a string quartet it covers it all um nobody's child at the time of writing um the bark at darling river they're all very strong um songs and uh look i could imagine this coming out in you know like 1988 and uh it would just slip in right in, in that sort of period as well. Um, mm. Very rousing. But it came out in, what was it, 2022? 2022, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, I think it's it's just, to me, I, I think it's um, a really strong late period Midnight Oil album, Resist, number six. Yeah. Great. My number six is Earth and Sun and Moon from 1993. As we discussed last week, to me, this is their 60s album, you know, lots of jangly 12-string guitars, a bit of psychedelia in this. Um, 
you know, the one single that was very successful off this was Truganini, which is a great song. But you've got the title track, you've got My Country, which is a just beautifully heartfelt song, Outbreak of Love, Now or Neverland. But I love the 60s sound of this record. Um, it really shows that influence, I think, that's always been there in the Midnight Oil catalogue. But it really comes to the fore on this album. They sort of let it shine more than they do on some of their other records. And it gives it a wonderful quality that I really, really enjoy. So that's my number six, Earth and Sun and Moon. Nice. Yeah, look, uh, really good to see that high up because it deserves the accolades. Um, all right. Um, my number five is uh, the Macarada Project. I love this album. Um, so this, to me, is the Midnight All Gospel album. It's a pop puri of Indigenous culture. It's a celebration. You've got the spoken word. You've got the music. You've got the sounds. Lots of guest stars. Just check it out. Um, you've got back porch balladry to brass punching, rattling rock. Um, it's. I think the word I would describe this is rousing. And um, Peter Garrett is the, the ringmaster um, and his vocals are front and centre and you've got all these guest stars woven around him. It's just yeah. such a wonderful album. Um, only goes to 33 minutes. I kind of wish maybe more. Um, that's my only little minor gripe, but um, it's just a wonderful, wonderful album. Um, standout songs, First Nation, Gadigal Land, uh, Change, in the, Change of the Day, Desert Man, Desert Woman. Check it out. It's just worth it. Yeah. And it went to number one. It was a yeah. Good album. yeah. Well, my number five is going to be Diesel and Dust from 1987. Um, you know, I mean, this was the huge one for them. You know, Beds of Burning was massive. Um, uh, you know, um, what was the other big one off this? I mean, Put Down That Weapon was a dead heart. That's the one I'm thinking of. Um, you know, but you've also got things like Sell My Soul and Bull Roarer and um, Warwick Herner. There's a lot of really, really good songs on this album. It's, yeah, shiny and commercial sounding, but I think it really, really works on this album. So, yeah, that's my number five is uh, Diesel and Dust. Nice. Um, my number four is Earth and Sun and Moon. So, um, like yourself, Bicycle art Legs, I really rank this album very highly. Um, I think this is very underrated. Um, 11 tracks. It's, you know, Feeding Frenzy, My Country, Trajanini, um, Outbreak of Love. This is Midnight Oil where... Not only they're discussing the usual template topics of social injustice, ecological um, stories of the country, but a lot of it is from the heart. It's much more personal. Um, it, it's the 60s album, as you say. There's a lot of jangly guitar. There's a lot of groove. There's even a little bit of Mo, you know, Motown feel to it. It's a, a, a very textured album. Um, yeah, look, it's really worth um, investigating. And I think it's, in my opinion, the most underrated Midnight All album. It gets kind of overlooked. and But I'm going to put a spotlight on it front and centre, number yeah. four, Earth and Sun and Moon. Okay. Um, that's great. My number four is going to be Breathe from 1996. As I said, to me, this is the underrated gem in the catalogue. It sounds like nothing else in the catalogue but I really love the sound of this album. It's swampy. It's oceanic. It's um, it's just, it's laid back for Midnight Oil. Um, but the songs on here, Underwater, I remember when that first was being played on the radio and that single did nothing here. It, it sank without a trace, pun, pun not intended. But um I loved it. I used to love it every time it came on the radio and I just grooved to it. Absolutely loved it. Surf's Up Tonight, wonderful song. Stins of Omission, um, Home, as you said, probably the underrated song on the album. Um, but I also love things like EB. You've got the instrumental gravel rash. Um, yeah, it's, it's an odd bird in the catalogue, but I really, really enjoy it. 
every time I go to listen to this, I really, really enjoy it. So that's why I'm ranking it as high as I am. That's my number num- number four. Okay, nice. Um, all right. This might be a bit of a surprise that it's not higher up. And maybe if it was a couple of years ago, it may have been number one. Um, but I'm going to pick 10 to 1 at number three. So this was the commercial breakthrough album in Australia. And uh, there are so many songs off this album that are part of the um, the Midnight Oil DNA or their live set. Um, you know, Short Memory, Read About It, US Forces and Power and the Passion. I'm actually obsessed with that song, Power and the Passion. I think that's probably my favourite Midnight Oil song of all the time. Um, it's just so much drama. Um, I think it was ranked at... Um, they had a poll of all these different critics of the 10 greatest Australian song, rock songs of all time, and Power of the Passion um, did hit, you know, the top 10, and deservedly so. It's a a great um, angry song about the haves and the have-nots, and it's still relevant to this day. Mm. Um, It always gets my my blood blood boiling um, going up. But, um, look, this is a great album. It's, It's, you know, probably just a, a notch below being their masterpiece, in my opinion. But um, look, between one and three, as we get to the top, um, there's not much difference, Bicycle Legs. But, mm. um, yeah, number three, this is yeah, 10 to 1. Absolutely. I mean, these top three for both of us, I think we'll agree, are the absolute cream of the crop. These are all, yeah. I mean, for me, these last three albums that I'm going to talk about, they're all 10 out of 10 albums. And my number three is Head Injuries um, from 1979. This is where the band found its sound, absolutely, for me. You know, right from the beginning when you get Cold Cold Change, I mean, that's just Midnight Oil to me, totally announcing themselves. Um, Section 5, Buster, Buster Bondi, just I love the tumbling uh, keyboard. I love that bit. Um, back on the borderline, absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, this is a, a raucous album. It's, as you say, it's a hard rock album. It's mm. really great. Stand in line, another absolute classic Midnight Oil song for me. Um, yeah, I mean, this could be number two, number one, depending on which day you ask me. It's my best mate's favourite Midnight Oil album, and it's top three for me. So, yeah, head injuries at number three. Right. Well, my number two, and you'll probably get my number one uh, if you've been writing it down, um, (laughs) Place Without a Postcard. This is a Stone Cold masterpiece, and um, this is where, in my opinion, the Midnight Oil sound was fully realised. It's got so many stole stone cold classic rock tracks. Don't want to be the one. Arms to stay. Um, I love the you know the the lyrical humor of Ned Kelly was king. Love on um, on sale. It's just a wonderful hard rocking album, hard hitting, and um, I think this was the um, the first masterpiece that um, Midnight Oil put. And um, yeah, I I. I say it's pretty close to a 10 out of 10 for me and it just sounds so fresh you know Mm. from a production side you wouldn't imagine that this came out in 1981 it sounds like 2023 it just yeah it's just sparkles so um place without a postcard that's my number two well my number two is going to be 10 to 1 so easily could have been number one for me I don't think there's much more I can add to this other than what you said. This album is a a really great balancing act for me because it's commercial and it's experimental at the same time. And that's a really tough tightrope to walk. Um, But, you know, it's got the big songs that you mentioned, but also things like Maralinga and Tin Legs and Tin Mimes, you know, things like that I really, really love. Um, Scream in Blue. Um, there's not a dud track on this album as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely great from beginning to end. My number two is 10 to 1. Nice. All right. Well, um, my number one is Diesel and Dust. Um, I think this is a stone-cold Australian rock masterpiece. 
I think artistically they were at their absolute peak and um, just the songwriting was just superlative. Beds Are Burning was the big hit on this album. I find this a very haunting um, song. Again, it's in one of those categories of a song that gets played a lot, but I never tire of it because I, I find different bits and pieces that I may have missed on the previous listening, whether it's the horn section, whether it's a little guitar line, it's just so well put together, this album, Bicycle Legs. And, and a, mm. a Beds Are Burning is an example how it's just so multi-layered. Um, put down that weapon, you know, Peter Garrett, and he's just his voice, it's part crooning and part sort of pleading, very direct. Arctic World, um, The Dead Heart, that's just a great song as well. So it, I just think that um, the... There was a lot of re- there's a lot of resistance overseas to Australian music as being too Australian, but the material on this album was so strong. People they had to put their defenses down and just accept, yep, yeah, yeah. let's take this 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 album to their hearts. And you can easily see how beds are burning. Or this album was a, a bit of a, a hit in the UK and the US. Um, yeah. Should have done better. I mean, it went to number 20. I cannot fathom why it didn't go like you 2 like number one. Mm. Maybe that's another show we can talk about, um, about Midnight Oil. Maybe they were too Australian just mm. to crack it to the, the superstar status. But in my eyes, this is a superstar status album. And yeah. It's my number one. It's the perfect realisation between commercial avant-garde and artistic, um, you know, being brave. It's it's a, it's a perfect blend of being commercial, but at the same time being adventurous and experimental and um, just writing damn good songs. Yeah. Yeah. No, well said. Well, my number one is Place Without a Postcard from 1981. To me, this album is flawless. I mean, there's just not a bad tr- song on it. Even though this album was a difficult birth for them, they did not get on all that well with Glyn Johns over in England. He did a stunning job of making this record sound great. Um, I won't go through all the tracks again because I think you hit all the high notes. Um, But it's just from beginning to end, this album is relentless. It has its moments where it, it has its quieter moments, but even then they're sort of, bubbling over with sort of angst, you know, a song like Bernie, for example. It's a low, a a more low tempo, quieter song, but the lyric is very angsty, you know. Mm. Um, Absolutely love this album, never get tired of it. So that's my number one, Place Without a Postcard. And I was just thinking, like, if I wanted to introduce a a listener to Midnight Oil, that could be the first album I'd like to, I'd hand them. Just to, mm. to, to get into the catalogue. What do you think? Yeah, that's an excellent choice as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, because yeah. if they listen to something like Diesel and Dust, which is my masterpiece, um, I think you've got to go on a journey when you're exploring mm. the discography. And I think that one, your number one, is a good start. And then go to explore more of the catalogue. Yeah, no, that's, that's probably a, a good thing to do, I think. So yeah, there you have it, there ladies we go. and gentlemen. Epic. That that is our studio albums ranked for Midnight Oil. Thank you for joining us on this long journey and going through the Midnight Oil catalogue. We've loved having you here. We've loved talking about one of our favorite bands of all time. Peter, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Not a problem. Um, please go and subscribe to Rock Daydream Nation if you're not already. So much good content over there, and he's been gracious enough to have me on his show a number of times. Always a pleasure when I get to go on on Rock Day Dream Nation. Please do like, share, and subscribe. It really helps the channel out. If you're new to the channel, please have a look at some of my other videos. I've got everything playlisted, so if you want to look at some of my other studio albums rank shows, there's a playlist for those. If you want to look at some of my Bicycle Legs Discovers Rush series, there's a playlist for those. And if you want to see my appearances on Rock Day Dream Nation or various other channels that I've been lucky enough to be on, there's a playlist for all my appearances on other channels. If you want to follow me on social media, I'm at Bicycle Legs on Instagram and Twitter, and I now have a dedicated Bicycle Legs Facebook page. 
please come and give those all a follow. I'd really love to have you there. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. See you later.